Hey everyone, David here. I wanted to share a few things before the episode begins. So first and foremost, you may or may not notice a little bit of an audio quality dip for about 15 minutes during this episode. Uh, we did run into some technical difficulties, but thankfully uh, we do record through Riverside and they did have a internet backup, so all was not lost. So I want to apologize for that in advance. And if you listen to it and you don't notice, then that's a good thing, right? But more importantly, we wanted to share that after this was recorded, it was announced that we've officially become partners with the Tokusatsu Network. Now, if you're not familiar with them, I would say they are the premier website to go to for any news related to your favorite tokusatsu movies, shows, etc. Uh, so if you're not familiar with them, I would definitely recommend checking them out. But I wanted to say thank you to the team for partnering with us. And we are looking forward to how that will continue to play out as things progress. So again, wanted to apologize for the technical difficulties. Wanted to give a shout out to Tokusatsu Network. And we hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to this episode of Saved by the Belial, an atrocious Ultraman podcast, the show where we only have three minutes to talk about an episode of Ultraman. I'm David. I think I'm still Chris. You are still Chris. Oh, thank God. And <laughs> joining us is Eric of Monsters vs. Men fame. Yeah. Hola. Woo! Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's a real honor for you to be here yeah. again. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I guess that was the last show. But. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is good. I, I love uh, this is a different type of podcast for me because normally it's giant monster movies. And now we're talking about a giant monster show. So I'm really excited about this show. We're excited that you're excited. <laughs> we're just here to keep it interesting for you. <laughs> <laughs> Give you a break from Alex for a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. Need it. Is this a break? Yeah. I don't know, yeah. man. <laughs> it's it's I mean, it's a break in one sense, but is it better? You should have <laughs> heard question. the whole uh Oscar rant. It's definitely a break. Uh-huh. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you need to release that publicly. I'm just saying. Yeah. That, that one was really good. <laughs> but uh before we jump in here, Eric, I thought, you know, just take a few minutes for people who are listening to this show who may not be familiar with yours. You know, here's your chance to pitch it. I mean, not to blow smoke up your ear, but you're the first podcast I listen to every week. I mean, it's not just because I've been on the show, but, you know, just between you and Alex and we shared a birthday with our old podcast, right? You guys just do a great job. And it's something that I look forward to every week. So anything that I can do to try to help promote you guys would, you know, it's the least I can do. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate it. Uh, and, and your listenership, I think, makes up for Chris's listenership. So. Thanks, Chris. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm he just... listens twice on my behalf. <laughs> oh, but man. those trollish comments on iTunes, those are all me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, um, we're, we're the Monsters vs. Men podcast. Um, we talk about giant monster movies one series at a time. Uh, we started with Godzilla, then we moved into Gamera, then we did King Kong. We've done a little bit of everything. We did a Toho series, and now this summer... We are doing Monster Madness, where we are taking some of the best 21st century uh, monster movies and putting them up against each other to see who becomes the Monsters vs. Men fan favorite 21st century monster movie. Um, if you like this show, I think you will like Monsters vs. Men because it moves at a, at a fast pace with our reviews. Uh, we really try to take a look at these movies, not from an expert sort of lens, but just from a, a lens of two fans uh, and two kind of lifelong friends who want to get to know each other through movies just a little bit better. Uh, and we do we do awards like uh, in this show. So if you like the awards segment, you'll probably like the awards <laughs> segment on our show. I wonder where I got that idea. Yeah, you say like this show as if the order was different. Well, try to be generous, 
<laughs> oh, thank you. And, and, well, we're not the first show, I'm sure, to do awards. There are so many podcasts out there. Um, but this is just a way that we like to highlight some of our favorite parts of every single movie that we watch. Even the movies that we hate, we give awards to. So it, it's fun. That's probably my favorite part of our episodes are our awards. Yeah, mm, I, I do mm. like when you do the awards. It really does force you guys to find things to appreciate about these movies, yep. right? Because, I mean, first and foremost, I love that you're not just a plot recap show because I'm, I, I don't know, I've just been of the opinion if I want to do that, there's wiki pages, right? Yes. IMDb, whatever. <laughs> but I want to hear like what these shows and, well, sorry, what these movies are really making you think and feel. I mean, I'm almost done with your episode on Underwater and there's just so many different things that you brought up there that I missed watching that yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, crap. OK, so I'm excited to go rewatch it because nice. of things I missed. Right. And that's mm -hmm. I feel like that's kind of been your guys goal with this show is not only to get people to watch these movies alongside you, but just to kind of have a different and maybe a more humble perspective on these things to encourage that reflection. And like, am I accurate in saying that? Yeah. And I think. I mean, that's a great compliment to us. If if you if it forces you to take a second look at something that maybe you dismissed initially, um, then we've probably done our job. Not that we love every single film, but we're going to give every single film that we watch uh, a chance for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even films that are derided by many, such as Gamera Super <laughs> Monster, which I know, you, or Space Women, Gamera Space Women, Thank as you. Chris likes Thank to call you. it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. We, we give every film a chance, and sometimes films really surprise us, such as Gamera Super Monster slash Space Women, um, which is one of yeah, our I was going to say, favorites. what do you mean give it a chance? <laughs> it speaks for itself. It's, it actually it spins is for pretty itself. good. <laughs> but in all honesty, I remember when we did that episode with our last show, like, and again, I think it's because we just got done watching Rise of Skywalker and our whole like, yeah, <laughs> we were just so exhausted by that. But after your guys episode, I remember being, you know, rewatching and being like, OK, this is not as bad as I made it out to be. And I, I really think there's something to be said about this, like collective hive mind mm. of fandoms. Right. If someone's just like, oh, this movie's bad or this movie's good. We just, we kind of go along with it. I mean, Chris and I, we've talked about that with like the prequels. I mean, Attack of the Clones is, you know, unforgivable no matter what, but the <laughs> other two are good. You know, there's just, but you, we were kind of, you know, teen angsty, like, oh, it's not real Star Wars or, oh, Jar Jar Binks. Yeah. And then you grow up and you're like, okay, they're really not that bad. No, I get that. Except for Attack of the Clones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm not an Attack of the Clones fan either. Um, but generally speaking, like, if we get that chance to, to offer a fresh perspective, um, then, then we've done our job. We try, I find a lot of times that when we're watching these movies, we do have a rating system that we do. Not that I love ratings, but we do have a rating mm -hmm. system. But most of the time, they all fall within kind of this medium range for me. It's all between yeah. a three and a four. And I think that's just because we always take a look. We, we, we're not necessarily about hot takes. We always take a look at the positives and the negatives. And there's always some middle place where usually these films fall. There's not the, the huge extremes that we make them out to be most of the time. Except for the Gamera trilogy. You guys love those. Those are great. <laughs> <laughs> those are great. So we know your show now. Uh -huh. Sounds great. If you haven't listened, maybe you should. He Chris. says pointing at himself. No, I, I, I listened because this is not the first time I've interacted with either, either a monster or a man from the show. But um, let's let's now stop talking about your show and talk about ours. Let's do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. What uh, what, what is about dick. Ultraman? What what makes you like? What what do you like about Ultraman? What's the difference between movies and shows for you? Uh, I mean, shows are, are quick hitters, you know, uh, you know, I think I was introduced to Ultraman because I was, um, so I, coming into the podcast, coming into monsters versus men, I was a kaiju newbie. I hadn't seen any Godzilla film except for maybe one or two. And over the course of the past, you know, year and a half after watching all these films, I've become a fan. Right. And there was a point, uh, a couple months in where I, I kind of became a kaiju addict, I would I would call myself. And so I was just getting my hands on anything kaiju related, any sort of media. And that led me, of course, to Ultra Q and Ultraman. 
Uh, it coincided really well with the Mill Creek releases, of course. Uh, I think that had a lot to do with it. But honestly, getting into Ultraman uh, was just kind of a, it just reminded me of the Showa era Godzilla movies, which I really loved and appreciated. Um, there's still Ultraman, the original. Uh, if I were to rank the Ultraman series that I've seen, 66 Ultraman is still my favorite. Um, there's just something maybe sentimental about it. There's just a lot of heart there uh, that I really appreciate. Well, so what was like, what was the order? Like you said the Mill Creek releases, mm -hmm. but yeah, I actually started with Ultra Q. Um, I started with Ultra Q and I didn't think anything would ever surpass Ultra Q, honestly, because I think Ultra Q is just a fantastic show in its variety. Mm -hmm. I love how much variety Ultra Q uh, presents. And I love that there's no, I, I like the aspect that there is no ultra to come save us, you know, that's mm -hmm. interesting to me. And, and so you, there's always a different sort of, of, um, solution or not <laughs> at the end of these yeah. episodes in ultra Q, which I like, whereas Ultraman, you do have a formula, which is actually something we'll get into this. I'm sure with Ginga, but it's actually something I appreciate about Ginga is it doesn't follow like the typical format of an Ultraman show. Um, sometimes you start with a battle Sometimes you end with a battle. You just don't know what to expect going into each and every one of these episodes. So I really like that about mm -hmm. Ginga. Um, but Ultraman does have this formula to it. And I actually think I, I, my appreciation for Ultraman grew as I watched more and more of the series. Because at first I thought there's no way that anything can surpass Ultra Q uh, in my mind. But honestly, like reflecting back on it now, Ultraman made me feel more than Ultra Q. So I had to go with Ultraman. Mm. Now, I haven't seen a ton of series. I've seen Ultraman, Ultra Q, Ultra 7, Return of Ultraman, Ultraman Z, and now Ultraman Ginga. Uh, but Ginga has definitely got me excited uh, to see what's next. He's like, I haven't seen a lot. And then he quadruples how many I've seen. <laughs> hmm. Well, I mean, come on. We're, if we're talking to like the Ultra fan base, they're like, uh, I, I've seen 24, ep 24 seasons, but not two of them. So, <laughs> yeah, there's one illegally bootlegged one that I haven't been able to get my hands on yet from a dark alley. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so five, five or six series doesn't feel like a lot when you're talking about the, the ultra series as a whole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so funny because, you know, I have all the Mill Creek releases up to now. There's there's just a few I haven't seen. I'm waiting to watch like Ace and Taro till we get to the show. But I've watched the rest and I'm like, I s still haven't even watched half of them. And I feel like I have. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I, I get that. Yeah. Um, so you're a dad. Yeah. How do your Whoa. kids feel about Happy Ultraman? Mother's Day. And more importantly, <laughs> how, what does your wife think? Uh, my kids like Ultraman and they like giant monsters and they like Godzilla whether it's Theo who has he's my oldest he's six he has a special spot on our show occasionally known as the theometer where he does a little monster review of the monsters that we're watching that week um, but now with with this show Ultraman Ginga honestly it was my younger son my three-year-old Levi who was really getting into it who just absolutely can't get enough of the the opening theme song doing the finger point that oh, Ultraman yeah. does up to the sky to doing the kicks <laughs> to doing the pose at the end. He kind of does it all and tries to sing along as best as he can in Japanese. And it's just, it's just great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then my, my youngest daughter, she's, she's one, um, but she's just started growling and playing with our Godzilla toys and growling. <laughs> so she's even getting kind of hooked on Kaiju. That's amazing. Well, that's cute. So we'll switch gears a little from being cute to being uh, controversial and fiery. What's your most, what's the most controversial drop? Spill some tea on us. What's your most controversial kaiju take? Mm. Or toku in general, maybe? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't like, I, I, lots of people give me a hard time. There's a, um, uh, Showa era Godzilla film, Ghidorah the Three Headed Monster, that I'm not super high on. That a uh, lot of lot of fans really love Ghidorah the Three Headed Monster. I'm not a huge fan of that one. So people right, give me a hard time. I just think it 
it just skews the human plot in that in that movie. But uh, I mean, I think I already mentioned uh, a hot take in a positive sense, which was, you know, Gamera Super Monster. I think that is actually an underrated gem of a film. So th- there's Amen. one that that either way you slice it. Like sometimes my takes are <laughs> are better than fan opinion. Sometimes they're worse. I just kind of watch the film uh, as it's presented, and we'll see what happens. Well, well that's a hot take. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no room for being reasonable in this yeah. day and age. This is this is the internet. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get some house cleaning out of the way. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to remind everyone. So we do have a group over at the website called The Jump. So as you know, we're not very active on social media. But this site here is just kind of gives you a place to really just have conversations, right? It's not about the algorithms. It's not about what's popular, trending, all those different things. It's just we have a group that comes in. We talk about Godzilla and Ultraman, stuff like that. Uh, We've actually close to about 10 members now, which has grown even just this week. So definitely appreciate everyone who's jumping in there. Uh, Like I said, it's just it's it's fun. Um, It's a way to kind of just talk about things we want to talk about instead of being inundated with what uh, Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg think we should care about. Uh, Apart from that, Chris, if you could read the newest review that dropped into our laps. It did. It was really solid thunk, too. This one is the drift space. You can hear the land of light. So this one, this one's kind of great, honestly. The hosts of the Kaiju Apostle podcast have returned with a new show, and it fires on all spacium beams. While these hosts inspired a direction of conversation for our own podcast in their prior show, their latest introduces a completely new format that still works to be thought-provoking and aggressively funny. That's That's a high compliment. It hurts to say that their current show is more confident and more entertaining, but sometimes that's how the Shandora crumbles. The choice to move on to Ultraman with a fresh, fun format ended up being a slam dunk, even fit a Space Jam 2 reference in there. And we can't wait for the future series they cover. It's just a shame Chris has to pick up David Slack in the comedic department. And, you know, these are all of the burdens that we have to bear you know, Galatian says that we have to bear each other's burdens and oh my, my shoulders are more muscular than they've ever been for carrying such a load. Man. Uh, yeah, that, that had to have been Jack who left that comment. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Rebecca wouldn't have done that. I don't think anyone else would have done that. So thanks, Jack. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. So uh, we do have one piece of listener feedback uh, in regards to Ginga. So this is from Nathaniel. He said, dang, you guys, I was almost halfway through Ultra 7 when I heard in the last episode you're doing Ginga next. I'm actually kind of glad, though. I recently caught a couple episodes of Jeed and Orb on Tokushatsu and have been wanting to watch one of the newer series. Not that I'm not loving the show of stuff as I just started Ultra Q, but I wanted to mix it up and my OCD just wasn't having it. So I guess I should thank you. Anyway, I've been loving the show. Going over the episodes helps jog my memory, and hearing different takes on them makes me appreciate them more. Pre was also a great guest and a fit right in. Keep up the awesome work. And yeah, we agree. Pre was an absolute blast, and we are definitely going to find a way to bring her back into the show. Just set the bar pretty high for Eric. Oh, shoot. He's in the room. (laughs) (laughs) Dang it. So, but, uh, you know, I I was thinking... Eric, yes. why don't you share just a couple of thoughts? Because Ginga is so new for you. I mean, you've really just watched a lot of the older Ultraman, right? Yes. Ultraman, uh-huh. Ultra 7, Return yep. of Ultraman. So up to episode six, I wanted to kind of hear your thoughts about this newness, I guess. Mm. And I really wanted you to go into the thoughts about Tomoyo and episode six uh, in regards to his privilege. Because you talked about that in that Monsters vs. Men, yeah. uh, the MVM Plus episode. And I was like, holy crap, that was absolutely spot on. I would love to have you share that. Yeah. Because I, I don't want to steal your thoughts. No, here. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, first off, I, I agree with what Chris was saying last episode about Ginga's design. I just think, I, I love Ginga's ultra design. Uh, it's mm-hmm. so sleek. I love the like the glowy uh, accents on, on his suit. That's really cool. Uh, so I, I'm a, actually a big fan. It's also somehow keeps itself pretty minimalistic, which I always appreciate. It's like minimalistic, which is just a bit of a, a flash. So 
I love Ginga mm. Soup. And overall, I just admire the shows. And the first six episodes, I think, do a really good job at establishing these characters. You get one episode really devoted to each of our main characters right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so you care for them right off the bat. Of course, this is not your SSSP Ultraman. This is a completely different type of Ultraman. And I love that we get a new sort of uh, take on, on the Ultra series. I think it's a fresh uh, breath of air. Because for me, like, I needed that, right? I needed that yeah. after watching series that felt a little bit formulaic. Yeah, you said you were getting really burned out with Return of Ultraman. Yeah. How long did it take you to watch that? Like, six it months? It took me about six months to watch Return of <laughs> Ultraman. And honestly, it was a burden. Are you saying that's a long time? Oh, boy. Yeah, it was, it was, and it was a burden sometimes, unfortunately, you know? Uh, and so maybe that's why it's so low on in my rankings. Like, that one's just it's, it's not my favorite. And your previous guest, I know it's her favorite, I think. Um, so it, it, everyone has different tastes when it comes to Ultraman, but I, I really love, I know some people will criticize Ultraman Ginga for uh, it just being set in one location. I actually think that's really, really charming. Uh, there's something mm -hmm. sim simple about it that that speaks to me. But in relation to your question about Tomoyo uh, and privilege, yeah, I mentioned this on um, kind of our Patreon bonus episode when we were just talking about the show with my co-host Alex. Yeah, there's this interesting idea that Ultraman Ginga brings up about him and about how because of his privilege in the position that he's in, he's actually missing out on an aspect of life uh, that that is our dreams, right? He has no dreams because of his privilege. And I think Ginga mm. is, is really doing something interesting that we wouldn't see in today's culture. Uh, it is examining what it means to have privilege and showing that, okay, there's some compassion that we can give to this character right here because he's missing out on, on a significant aspect mm -hmm. of life, on, on, on the desires that most of us um, don't have. I think that's really interesting because we don't see that compassion given to that type of character too often in the media no. today. There's, there's a, and it made me think of this tweet I saw um, that it, it's, I can't remember the exact wording of it, but I think is it's, it's just something a lot about the lines of um, we often view like privileged people, like the dominant group. We, we often view privileged people or the dominant group um, as needing to be defeated, but lots of times we need to realize that they are already defeated in a sense, right? It, like they, they, they holding something with their privilege that uh, makes them miss out on some rich aspects of life. If that makes mm -hmm. any sort of sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it, it does. Dang. And I mean, it really makes me think of something that uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, you know, in his letters, uh, what was it? The letters and papers from prison. Mm -hmm. You know, and obviously it's just a little blurb out of a full quote, but, it, you know, we must learn to regard people less in light of what they do or admit to do and more in the light of what they suffer. Mm. Right. And you could be like, well, they're privileged. How are they going to suffer? But you look at this character and it, it's not a good life. Right. He's not happy. He's not. He, there's no joy in his heart at all. That's why he was able to be possessed the way that he was, mm -hmm. because it was capitalizing on this this darkness that was in his heart. And I think we forget that just because someone has privilege or status, that doesn't mean that their life is good. It doesn't mean that they're happy. It doesn't mean that things are going well for them. And in his choice, he didn't choose that, right? His parents were you know, born, they worked hard. And it almost seems like maybe he didn't get that affirmation and that love from his parents that children need, you know? So mm -hmm. that's something where I can sympathize with that. So when you had mentioned all that, I was like, dang, like that just went over my head and I missed that. So that was such a good thought. No, he's, he's a really interesting character that I think develops in the show overall. And the other thing mm -hmm. that you just brought up, David, is I love the aspect here where, you know, there's a darkness that's just grabbing a hold of kind of the maybe misordered desires of each of these characters, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, Bonhoeffer might talk about that as well, <laughs> actually, like disordered desires or something like that. Um, but yeah, the darkness takes hold of like the thing that they are clinging to, that they might not even mm -hmm. know that they're clinging to, uh, and brings that out into the worst parts of them. It makes them into a monster, which is just really interesting and fascinating to me. But I love how every character is involved in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, we ready to jump on in here? Well, he he that was like uh, the theological reflections already. Man, we're doing this yeah. all backwards. <laughs> Still Chris's <laughs> thunder. All right. Our first episode is episode 7, Monster Competition. A number of spark dolls are confirmed on the hills of Furuhoshi. A fierce battle follows between Hikaru, his friends, and alien Icarus over the spark dolls. Alien Icarus changes into Tyrant, a furious monster who goes on the rampage. After Ginga and Jean 9 won the battle over Tyrant, they are now facing an even more powerful soldier of evil called Dark Zagi. I love I how have- many of the kaiju. I love how many kaiju names just start with dark. <laughs> That's kind of the way that I would write a fan fiction. Oh, this one's <laughs> Dark Ultraman, Dark Leo. Oh, Dark Zagi. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So is that going to be your uh, Fifty Shades spinoff of Ultraman? You just take Fifty a Twilight? Shades of Dark Lugia. Yes. Wait, Lugia. Are we talking about Pokemon now? <laughs> well, I got I got Pokemon Coliseum <laughs> on the brain. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, this episode just starts off, honestly. Uh, It starts off with a bang with these six episodes. Mm -hmm. And if you took the first 10 minutes, you would have no idea where this episode is heading, right? You've kind of got like a romance (laughs) fake out. Uh, You've got Ultraman Tiga showing up, the hybrid monster that defeats Tiga, and then only for Jean to save Tiga (laughs) to be defeated by this dark Ultraman looking figure. Right, only for Ginga to come back in and, and save the day in what I consider to be one of the coolest battles I've actually seen in Ultraman. Mm-hmm. So this is a standout episode for me right off the bat of these six episodes. Yeah, yeah. So this is one of those things where with the writer, you know, Kichi Hasegawa. So he wrote for Ultraman Nexus. So it's cool to see Dark Zagi come back because he's the antagonist from that show. Um, but you know, that fight there at the end. Yeah, it's like, it's awesome. The CGI is eh, but I also just don't care because yeah. it's fun. So I'm like, I'm not going to pick it apart, right? But see, it's funny. You're mentioning all that. And my favorite part of this episode is Alien Icarus. Like, he's just absolutely ridiculous. And the part where he impersonates Misuzu, and just like the beard and the ears. And it's like, <laughs> how, how do you know she's not the fake? And yeah. Dude, seriously? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's the best. That's like the eyes. comedy part. Oh, man. Because it's like the classic, like, uh, you know, I've cloned your friend and you can't tell which one's which. But it's so obvious in this one. Oh, great. <laughs> classic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. They don't have to, like, reveal a secret from their childhood. It's like, no, I'm pretty sure I can tell. Yeah, no, that one has ears. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, man. I did notice the CGI in this one as well, because I think from Z, I know Z has CG. Like, it's got those effects, obviously. But um, this one felt a little more experimental. And the nice thing is it still didn't do too much. Like, I think they knew their limits, whereas I think Common Rider, I'm thinking especially of um, Common Rider Ryuga with the uh, dragons and stuff, they leaned into the CG way too early and just created some really wooden looking episodes. So I'm really glad. I feel like they know exactly where, how much to do. Yeah. Yeah, it's not overboard. It's not like the, the foundation of the show. It's just mm-hmm. an accent, right? that weird awkward spot where we stop talking because like who's gonna say what yeah all right wait are we all drinking alcohol tonight that's great (laughs) (laughs) monday night (laughs) all right next one is episode eight the closed world while everyone else wears a school uniform at school he grew it's in his private attire he feels uneasy but stays on instead of going back to England to join his parents. One day, Hikaru and his friends are swallowed up into a distorted space time and get trapped at the Furuhoshi Primary School. It is an absolute shame we did not get Bolt on in this episode. Like, yeah. they're trapped, right? Like, that's in exactly Bolt on. And we don't get it. Like, that, that was just such an easy layup there. <sighs> I could see why in the context of this series, if like it's like really as budget crunched as it sounds like it was, a bolt on episode would be a huge budgetary constraint in terms of how do you do that with two sets? (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah, this was a bit of a weird episode, honestly. Like the first <laughs> half, not that not that other episodes aren't weird. Most of these are pretty weird, but the first half of this mm. episode mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. is basically a recap. And then yeah. the second half is just a bit of a romp, right? They're just like having fun. And I already said I loved Ginga visually, but it really stands out here when we get this nighttime boxing scene, right? Um, <laughs> yes. Where like the, those accents that I mentioned just start to glow. So cool when he comes in with that boxing robe. Like there's no reason it's for so it. Awesome. It's just awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's a creative way to, um, use the setting that they do have, right? And still do Mm -hmm. something different. Like they knew they had to vary it up. And so they're like, let's create a boxing match out of power lines. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. We'll use the same setting, but we'll we'll mess with the lighting a little bit uh, and try something different. And have all the toys in the stands. (laughs) That (laughs) was amazing. Well, so here's the thing, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm like, well, I have time to look stuff up because it's literally a recap episode. But between the last episode and this one, there's about three months. So it makes sense, Mm. right? You know, you have those three months, kids are coming back and watching it again. You kind of have to. Oh, in real life. Yeah. In real life. Yeah. So (sighs) that's where I'm like, I can understand why they do that. But it was, I, I've, I've seen this one before and I forgot (laughs) that the first half is the recap. And then the last half is some of my favorite like stuff from this whole series. Because even the monster, the the three-headed monster Galbaros, again, he's from Nexus, and he's like one of the most iconic monsters from that show. So I just love that they incorporate him into this whole boxing thing. So good. Okay, so I'm glad for the real world context, because I'm like, this is episode eight, my man. I have not forgotten what's happened in the first seven episodes. <laughs> yeah. No, th- That's this isn't a deep episode by any means but i i do think it's impressive that they took a a recap episode and made something out of it right um Mm -hmm. lots of times and we saw this if you watched ultraman z uh we had a couple now of course they had some other issues going on but we had a couple of recap episodes where it's just like i could have skipped that yeah 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 i think the only recap episode was the canagon one that i really liked because canagon's just because canagon's hilarious yeah (laughs) Right. Episode number nine. We've got the stolen Ginga Spark. It turns out that Hikaru and his friends are not the only ones that are swallowed up into the distorted space time. I have to go back really quick. That description for episode eight. Why is it important to the plot that everyone's in their school uniforms, but he's in his private attire? Because <laughs> he's different, man. He's not like other girls. <laughs> it just hit me. I'm like, Okay. Um, well, what are they going to say? The first half's a recap, and then yeah. the rest of it's a new episode. <laughs> yeah, you can't put point. that in the description. <laughs> okay, sorry. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, Misuzu's father and his work pals pals are also forced <laughs> to spend the night at Furuhoshi Primary School. When morning dawns, monsters howling echoes the skies. Uh, uh, Hikaru reaches out for his Genghis spark, but cannot find it anywhere. Oh no. The dream theme just keeps popping back up, right? Uh, and mm-hmm. in this episode, we see the boxer Go, who has kind of had his dream taken away from him. And and so I like we kind of get this sort of aspect creeping back in. I think we got a little bit away from it in the last episode, as, as fun as that episode turned out to be. This episode brings it right back. Um, and then, of course, uh, Misuzu doing the alt live i wasn't expecting that alt live Mm -mm. (laughs) Uh, but she was definitely cute as red king um as the camaraderie of this group just keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger you just feel more and more for these characters and and you really have to love her in this episode I love watching a show where everyone likes each other like i I said this last one but Mm -hmm. it's actually so nice like even at any like antagonism, you just know like it's fun, friendly, and you feel it. There's actually good chemistry. Mm-hmm. It's like I it, you could almost just watch them with no Ultraman at all and still have a lot of fun. So yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah, and I I think you're right, Eric. Like we do get back on track with the whole dreams thing. What I think is interesting, and you've already watched SSSSS Gridman. But again, Hasegawa being a common writer here, what's 
common writer. <laughs> um, I was like, is that a pun? <laughs> it wasn't intentional. Uh, I, I think it's interesting. A common theme for him is people's emotions giving birth to these monsters, right? Mm-hmm. So we see that with Akane and even with uh, Dinah Xenon. I mean, that's something that they're pulling up is the fact that these kaiju exist when people have these strong emotions. So it's interesting that like, that's imp- apparently an important theme to him. But I really find this episode to be compelling because Go thinks that a dream only comes true if you don't have setbacks or struggles, right? Mm -hmm. But then he counters with their optimism by saying, you only say that because you're young. And it makes me wonder, I mean, as Westerners, we have this tendency to shun wisdom from our elders, right? We think that, you know, a 25-year-old who has a bachelor's degree is all of a sudden more learned than someone who has lived for 65, 70 years. And it's not necessarily true or false, but as I've been reading people like Jonathan Haidt and others, like I think that is something that we've lost is our tendency, to, or I guess our inclination to respect and take that wisdom from people who have lived life. I think goes wrong here, but it made me think about that as a whole. Mm-hmm. Whereas here, he had something to learn from youth. Exactly. Yeah. There was so much more to discuss there, but our our time is that's up. the that's the <laughs> gimmick. <laughs> Alrighty. All right. Episode ten. Uh, the Jet Black Ultra Brothers. A jet black Ultraman appears before Ultraman Ginga and attacks Ginga savagely while changing into the form of Ultra 7. Ginga falls and Hikaru loses consciousness. Monsters begin to show up and swarm into the Furuhoshi Primary School. Can the combined forces of Misuzu, Kenta, and Chigusa stop them? I have to ask, how did you all feel about Jesse Line? The three-headed kaiju. Oh. Fierce. <laughs> <laughs> he's ridiculous. <laughs> he, uh, he, he's featured in one of my favorite episodes of Mabius. Um, like, Mabius <laughs> gets his butt royally handed to him, and it's only Father of Ultra coming in to save him. But it's such an oh, interesting monster. Oh, I already wrote my theological description. <laughs> but... Yeah, it's just like it was such to me such a weird monster to pull up. But I mean, I guess you really don't have a lot of monsters that have three heads apart from Dada, right? So that'd be kind of weird. Yeah, yeah. No, I liked it, and I could see. I don't really like the nice thing about the show is that it even if they're re, I mean, even Z reusing kaiju was on purpose. And I kind of like that even though everyone's every time I watch an episode like, did you remember this one from this show, this episode? I'm like, no. Had I seen it, I still wouldn't remember, I promise you. But it doesn't feel like I'm left out and it doesn't feel like they're just bringing back costumes because they need money. Mm -hmm. So I'll give them a lot of credit for that too. Yeah, again, this this episode, once again, is twisting that that dream theme. And I I really like what it does. after Hikaru is defeated and he's in that dream sequence and he's having the conversation mm-hmm. with Misuzu's father. And the camera does a really interesting thing right there where whenever it's focused on Hikaru's yeah. perspective, he's in the foreground and Misuzu's father is in the background. But then when Misuzu is Misuzu's father is sharing his perspective, the, the perspective of the camera literally mm-hmm. shifts to mimic that shift mm-hmm. in perspective. And it's disorienting, but it just goes to show that there are two different perspectives to be. And I think that's a really interesting visual flair um, that I really respect the directors uh, for coming up with. It was really cool. Man, if if there's a podcast looking for a film snob, you should should call him. Yeah, you're the one who like, God, what Godzilla movie was it? Or maybe you're just talking about Ultraman. Yeah, it was with Jasoji. You're bringing up like, French cinematography and all this stuff. And I'm like, I, I would never would have guessed that at all. Movie so. screens go fast. <laughs> uh, so this is such an interesting episode to me at the end, because first of all, I think it's really effective that Misuzu doesn't get possessed until the end of the show. 
Right. Mm-hmm. I think that makes it more meaningful. But that quote where it's like, you're the same as that man. No, you have the same blood running through your body as that man. The coward blood of the man who tried to kill your sweetheart. There's just so, there's, yeah, so much I can say about that, but I can't. <laughs> uh, we'll That's get there, the episode, baby. All right. Speaking of episodes, next one is episode 11 Darkness and Light. Alien Knuckle takes advantage of the anger in Misuzu and turns her into the gigantic monster, the Super Grand King. To stop the monster from wreaking havoc onto the school, Hikaru transforms into Ultraman Ginga, but realizes it's Misuzu inside. Can he thwart the monster without hurting Misuzu? Chris, I have something very fun to tell you. So the original Grand King first appeared in a film in the 80s, which also featured Kid Taro. What? Yeah. This is not the first time we see Kid Taro. Oh my gosh. Anytime you get me like a kid version, I'm like, wow, I've just latched onto this one. I've pack bonded with this costume. <laughs> Give me the vinyl figure now. Yeah. This so episode is just so over the top in terms of mm-hmm. acting. Um, but I actually love it. Uh <laughs> I, I love it. I, I love the melodrama here between um, Hiraku and Misuzu. I, I just think like it's something that I would would have appealed to me even more as a high schooler, even as as a you know thirty oh, yes. two year old dad. I was still like moved and and touched by their you know kind of the breaking apart of this friendship, this semi romance, and then them coming together. I would be lying if I say said I didn't have chills when they finally came back together. The Ginga theme started on. I was like, that is just awesome. You know, and it, yeah. mm-hmm. it brings up they're, they're using language in a different sort of way. You know, they're calling each other fool and then he calls her fool again, but it's more in this like loving sort of way. I'm a sucker for that type of thing. And that was definitely definitely the sentimental part of the show coming out that I actually really loved. Yeah. Mm. It's like See, Degrassi uh, if Degrassi High had Kaiju. And didn't Drake was in Degrassi, right? He was. He was the yeah, one so who got Drake. paralyzed. <laughs> uh, so, Eric, you bring that up, and that's actually one of the most meaningful parts, I think, in the whole sh- this series, because I thought it was a really interesting contrast between, you know, Hatsuma, the priest, and the Shirai, and then Hikaru and the Suzu, right? So, like, the first one, like, Hatsuma's willing to hold on to her and cast out her demons, like, he's not letting go but the two are so young that they don't know how to do that conflict resolution, right? They're, they're hurling insults at each other. You know, uh, Misuzu just is projecting all of this pain and aggression onto Hikaru. I'm not saying they're necessarily wrong. I mean, they're young, but again, that kind of goes back to that wisdom where you, you really do see like, it's just a different of approach in that conflict resolution. I just thought it was a really nice parallel there because it's, Hatsuma hasn't had a lot to do so I like that we got this here towards the end it's great that they're able to kind of with this sort of connection that they have here it's great that the the walls actually have started to come down and she's able to speak truthfully to Hikaru Mm -hmm. for like the first time in a sense yeah yeah. And like you said, having this at the end of the show makes it so much more meaningful and it doesn't feel like it's only been 11 not at all. All right. That Last didn't feel episode. like it would have been three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how that works. All right. Last episode, guys. Episode 12, Your Future. My future. Yes. Your future. <sighs> Is it uh, the Magus or Magus? I don't know how to pronounce that. Say it loud and say it fast, and no one will know the difference. The uh, Broheim of Darkness, who is responsible for turning all of the Ultra Warriors and monsters into dolls, now shows his form. His name, Chris, is Dark Lugiel. (laughs) The special waves he emits knocks down one person after another in the town of Furuhoshi, and even the light from the eyes of Ginga goes out. Only Ultraman Taro is left out in his doll form. Is this the end of all human hope? I think I would have had more of an appreciation for this episode if I had loved Taro in the show. Uh, he's great, and Taro is just comedy relief throughout this entire series. 
But the moment where he finally turns big and he has his theme song come on, I just know I would have been hyped <laughs> if I had actually yeah. watched Ultraman Taro, the series, before this episode. I just feel the hype swelling. I feel all the emotions rising and everyone else watching. And I'm like, that's another Ultraman. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if I remember right, I think it was an anniversary for Taro because so Ginga came out in 2013, I believe. And then Ultraman Taro came out in uh, 1973. So I'm going to double check myself here. I think that's right. Uh, Yeah. So 2013 and 1973. So that was kind of if I remember right, why they included him because it was, you know, anniversary, all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, I get that. I, I've seen more Taro in other shows, so I kind of had that connection. Um, I've seen Ultraman Taiga, and Taro has you know a bit of a role in that too. Um, but Eric, I want to hear your thoughts. And Chris, obviously, you're welcome too. But I just, you know, more than the dreams, like I think that's part of it. I think the show, the real message is forgiveness, right? Because, you know, this idea, I, I think that society doesn't flourish without that forgiveness. So you see all of these people who were possessed by that darkness, like they all did horrible things. They were monsters. They caused all these destruction, all this destruction. But whenever that all happened, what you didn't see is the characters unfairly condemned those people. Mm -hmm. Right. And there at the end, we see that they're learning and becoming better versions of themselves. And you don't do that by shaming people into oblivion. Right. You do that by still acknowledging their humanity and their dignity. And I love that here at the end, we see that. They, they, they are still people. They made bad mistakes. They went down the wrong road, right? We're seeing that with the school, this idea of being founded on dreams, and then they go into the real world. They lose sight of those dreams. They become bitter. But because of this group of people, it's not just Tomoya who has a dream. They've also inspired these people to reevaluate and remember the dreams that they had previously. Yeah. And, and this doesn't there's not a better example of this than Mizuzu with her father um, Mm -hmm. and forgiving Mm -hmm. her father for that betrayal. Um, Because at first you're thinking maybe she won't, but she does. And the father in a sense earns that forgiveness, right? He demonstrates that forgiveness. It's it's not just a show. Um, He demonstrates it. And so she is able to forgive him and they're able to all work together at the end. Ultraman. (laughs) oh man all right let's see are we ready for the awards yes 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 all all right eric who earned your most beautiful kaiju award okay so i'm gonna go with antler um who is the bug kaiju bug kaiju honestly like i just think they're awesome i love megalon's design from godzilla um <laughs> it's just fantastic it reminds me i know we've already had a, a pokemon reference there's another the heracross. pokemon heracross Her. um yeah that, yes. that, that antler it clearly clearly antler influenced heracross so uh you're I think right antler's you should really say cool what about you, Chris? I, I'm i going to give... This is the first of many awards I'm giving to Galbaros tonight. There we go. That was a pretty sick design. There's a there's a pretty similar design in Sentai Ryuzhulger, which I really liked. And then I saw this one, and it's like, well, this one's, this one's superior. So in the fact... In the context in which Galbaros was in in this made it so much funnier took such a funny design and put it in such a good context. So Yeah, because the show he's from is incredibly dark. So seeing him in such a comical light is... Interesting. Is, um, yeah, well, Galbaros, call me Mabius. <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, I had to go with Tyrant only because Tyrant has Bimstar, and Bimstar is my favorite kaiju. So... Mm-hmm. Just kind of a no-brainer for me but okay okay well so in the monster graveyard award category i know we had to kind of shift that a little bit from the first one since no one's getting like space and beamed in half or anything but i already warned you galbaros was getting more than one so i gotta go i gotta go with him again 
See, I can't. It's not my favorite it. episode. I'll I'll tell you that now. So uh, mm-hmm. I'm not going to be repeating myself all night. But see, I I didn't place any rules on this like you guys do with NVM. <laughs> you can't like reuse. I don't I don't remember like when you do your like recaps and stuff because otherwise it would be so hard. <laughs> it shows like this. Well, yeah, with only so few episodes. Yeah. Yeah. So what about you, Eric? Um. So for me, I can't remember this this uh. Who who's the what's the kaiju's name? Is Knackle Gray that does like the the kiss and yeah. is kind of manipulating people? Well, then it has to be goes knockout punch mm. on Alien Knackle Gray, <laughs> yeah. where he just takes him out in one punch. It was just fantastic. <laughs> totally. Yeah, that that was gonna be mine, like because it's so good. Then I had to go with. Uh, uh, Dark Zoggy, though, because I hate Dark Zoggy. So if I could see him be destroyed, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy with that. Just destroyed so, anytime. Yeah. But the reason why I couldn't do that for Monster Graveyard is because the How in the Heck Did He Get Away with That award is Go being able to knock out Alien Knackle in a single punch. I'm like, <laughs> Very true. what? Freaking Little Mac over here. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mine uh was it was uh Ginga's consciousness um trick when I guess it's not a trick, but his uh consciousness ability where Hikaru and Mizuzu are able to link their consciousness, but Ginga is just frozen there as a statue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's just left so vulnerable, but he gets away with it. So I don't know how the heck he did, but he got away with it. Got away with it. Yeah. See, your Little Mac reference was better than mine. I was going to do the same thing, but talk One Punch Man. So. I mean, that's that's debatable. I, I would say yours <laughs> is a little better. <laughs> Just a little bit. Just a little. Yeah. All right, Chris, what about uh, Aim for Its Butthole Award? So this one, I, I usually watch these through the... Uh, What's I can't I'm sp- totally spacing on the service. Movie spree. Thank you, movie spree. But this one I was watching on YouTube, and um, the the this is a cheat. This is such a cheat code. But the I think this was like a fan dub, someone that he was just kind of doing as he watched it. Uh, their little their little like mean flirting session at the end had some of the funniest. And the funniest thing is they translated Baka as a hole. So the moment that you had talked about earlier when they were calling each other Bacchus and it was getting like sweeter, <laughs> it was kind of like, it's kind of like kids cover your ears. It was kind of like they're saying like, asshole. Asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so I know it's a cheat. I just, I love, I just love the world of dubs. I'm so, so I'm so sorry, Mill Creek for not watching yours. That's assuming they listen to us. If they don't, they should start. What about you, Eric? Well, so I kind of had two, which is a little bit of a cheat, of course. Um, so the actual line that I know we try to go for for humor here, but so I, on our show, we have the most memorable line award and it mm-hmm. kind of goes to a line that just stands out to us. It oh, could be wow. humorous or it could be like meaningful in some way. And there was one line that I thought was kind of meaningful and it was um, Rido, I guess. I don't know if, if I pronounced that right, but um He's talking to Hikaru and he says, the three are fighting to protect the school. And then he hesitates. He says, no, they are fighting for you. And I just, mm-hmm. I just love that uh, line delivery. I thought it was great. But the aim for its butthole award <laughs> is the dolphin hurts me whenever uh, Mizuzu <laughs> is just throwing stuff <laughs> at Hikaru and there's like a, <laughs> a, a blow up <laughs> dolphin and he's just like the dolphin hurts me <laughs> that's so, so good, good. <laughs> that was my runner up it was so good yeah so good yeah I, I had to go with this one though it was uh, Alien Icarus I'll work to please you in any way which way I can <laughs> oh gosh that's funny okay so favorite episode of this batch uh, Eric accidentally had Chris talk First for Aim for its Butthole Award, that was you first. So what would be your favorite episode out of these six? Um, I'll say my favorite episode was the first one of these six, episode seven. Um, I just, 
I had no idea where that episode was heading, but by the end of it, we had an episode that brought us um, close relationships, that brought us a lot of humor, and that brought us the best fight of the series so far, hands down. So episode seven. There we go. What about you, Chris? I'm going to go with the next one since we're, this is just these six. Even though it was half a recap, it was such a, it was, I, I'm almost giving it a little extra because it made a recap interesting. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of times that we're used to recaps. I mean, Malcolm in the Middle, Everyone Smile, two episodes before the final episode of Sentai is always a recap. They're always boring, but <laughs> this one was interesting. And I think just the boxing ring was so creative that it really kind of, it really put on display the creative depths that the show needed to go into. So I really appreciated it. it and not just because it's like, like I said, like I said, I didn't forget the first seven episodes that I've been, that I've been binging. No, I was still entertained. Even just the second half made it fun enough. So how often do you watch Malcolm in the middle? Enough. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I went with the same one, actually, just because the last half is just so much fun. I mean, it, yeah, it is a recap episode, but to have something that can turn a recap episode into something enjoyable, I think that speaks volumes to what that last half mm -hmm. has to do, right? Now, here's the kicker. You know, it's not very often that we're going to have 12 episodes and have to choose our favorite out of the entire series. But that was probably my favorite episode out of this six. But I am going to say I think the best episode, which I normally don't do, is episode 11. Um, again, not only this idea of forgiveness, but, you know, how you're talking about, you know, Misuzu's dad. I think what is incredibly amazing and, again, very countercultural is the idea that Misuzu's dad was possessed, right, in the last episode, but by the next episode, he's already deemed worthy to ult live, right? Like, mm -hmm. that is huge, because for most of us, or I guess how society would say someone would be forgiven is there's like 500 hoops you have to jump through, right? And there's just, there's all these litmus tests you have to pass to show that you're, you're sorry and that you've made penance, but now it's like whoever is in charge of handing out these little spark devices was like, nope, you know, you, you realize what you did. Like you have that actual, you know, contriteness and deemed him worthy to, to protect these people. And I was just like, dang, that's it's God, awesome. David. God this is, is handing Ultraman. out those devices. <laughs> what? So, like, you mean Kami? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, no, what about so, you guys? So that's the thing, David, you. is, uh, it's kind of cheating because I said, Episode seven was my favorite of, of these six, but actually I think my favorite of the entire series is episode 11. So I wasn't counting yeah. episode 11 in there. I just, I just love the sentimentality of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's romantic in a sense. I said it's the only episode that kind of gave me chills. Um, so I've got to go with that one. I am unfortunately not giving this episode a hat trick, but I am choosing 12. Because it took all of it took everything from eleven, and I think wrapped up this. It wrapped up all, enough of the series that I wanted it to be kind of tied up with that same emotional, and they stuck the landing pretty well mm -hmm. for only having so few episodes. That it felt like it had the emotional impact of an entire like run, yeah, an entire twenty five episode run, even an entire fifty. Like a lot of times in episode by episode twelve of a lot of shows I'm watching, I'm like, hey, who's that name? What's the name of that one character? You know, the main one. But by this one, I was like, if I lose any of these people right now, I will kill both them and myself. <laughs> like the Rosa meme. So I'm going with 12 just because it took all of the weight of everything before and just so nicely tied it up. So that was intense. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Chris. Yes, I have two. You have two. Yeah, one's kind of serious and the other's kind of funny. Oh man, I don't yeah. know if my backing track's long enough for that, but hey, I don't know. Let's give it we'll a see. shot. <laughs> so, I just, in honor of our guest, I wanted to. The first one is 
So the book of Proverbs is kind of given with this context of this wise and royal king, this father, is teaching his son everything he knows about every subject under the sun. It's like, hey, you want to know about women? You want to know how to build a fence? You want to know how to rule a kingdom well? Like, I have all this wisdom and I'm going to dump that onto you. And I think the Monsters vs. Men format is kind of the same. And I'm not going to say which one I think is the wise one. And I'm not going to say which one is the one that I think needs to sit back and listen. But it could be both <laughs> in different contexts. But, like, if you kind of like that context of, like, someone who knows a lot is talking to someone who doesn't know a lot, like, Monsters vs. Men is like the kaiju proverbs. So I will say that Eric is the Proverbs 31 woman, the one of virtue who sits at the gate and then... <laughs> brings honor upon his household so <laughs> oh my gosh oh my yeah. goodness thank you for that chris i i will gladly be a proverbs 31 woman today <laughs> oh man it's something we should all aspire to <laughs> we should all aspire to yeah but I do, I mean, the serious one is just, I, I do love this idea that we are, it does call us to even reckon with our own darkness, the, own, the things inside. And I think, Eric, you said earlier, sometimes it's even the unreflected, unknown stuff that gets pulled out into the kaiju. Mm -hmm. And I love how the series forces us to kind of look at that darkness within ourselves. It's that one line, like, why doesn't God deal with the evil? Well, it's because the line of evil right, runs directly down the center of us. Yeah. And... It's, it's in that reckoning with that evil that we come out healed on the other end. It's not the avoidance. Of course, we're not going to turn into kaiju, but spiritually we might. So I this series actually, like in, like I said, in a lot of ways, the 12, the 12 chapters really pack a real punch. Yep. So. Just like the 12 tribes. It's, oh my gosh, there are 12. And then when Taro moves from being a little lifeless toy into being a giant who saves the day. It's the opposite of what idols do, which are vain and lifeless. They're just blocks of wood. But Taro is like, he's like Jesus, like there's no help. And then Taro comes out of the toy form to save the day. Yeah. And yeah, uh, I do actually want to leave one comment on what you just said in this serious matter there. You know, and it is, it's Th this interesting idea that with Miss Shirai, right? Like she had no idea that her dark heart had been influencing everyone else. And to me, I, I'm thinking like when I have this anger and bitterness and all these things in my own life, like I may not think I'm putting that into the world, but that's exactly what's happening. Right. So it's just interesting. Like she doesn't know what's going on, but it's that unexamined heart, so to speak, or unexamined life that really is why all these people got possessed so it's just kind of not to take their agency away it's just how infectious these mentalities and you know perspectives can be but mm. so eric we're not done no. but for this episode we are so as we close i wanted to give you a chance to kind of pitch again your show talk about where people can find you I want to make a pitch and say that you guys do weekly episodes and for $5 God a month, sweet. you can become a, what is it? A Kaiju base might. Is that what it is? <laughs> a bargain base uh, might. Yeah. Bargain base might. That because was we're the, um, we're, we're the bargain base basement of the monster podcasting airwaves. So yeah. But, uh, what <laughs> I love though is for sense of monster cringe. <laughs> what I love is that, you know, it's, I think the minimum is like five bucks a month, but you guys do a bonus episode every week. And like I was saying earlier, those are my favorite episodes. And it's not because you guys keep talking about me for some weird reason. It's the, the conversations you guys have there. It's just, it's more of that kind of, I wouldn't say laid back. Your whole show is very conversational, but just some of the stuff you, you all get into, it's just, it's, there's a reason why I start my week off with that. So I just, yeah. if if you're in the mood for a new show and you want eight episodes of a show a month, I would say it's a pretty good deal. <laughs> but yeah. again, for people who don't know where to find you, this is your chance to, you know, sell yourself. I, I appreciate that, David. And thank you for having me on and, and for also listening to our show. That That's, I'm, I'm honored. But um, yeah, you can find us on any podcasting platform, Monsters vs. Men. Um, we don't really have much of a Twitter, but we are on Twitter at MVM underscore pod. 
um, where usually our co-host gets into more trouble than I do. So, um, <laughs> but you can find us over no, there. And and honestly, yeah, we would love to hear from you as well. So if you listen to us on this podcast, you find your way over on Monsters vs. Men. We'd love to hear any feedback that you have for our show. So thanks again, David, for and Chris for having yeah. us on. Appreciate it. I was going to ask what you say about me on these bonus episodes, but then I just saw, I just heard you say in my mind, subscribe. It's only $5. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you won't know until you subscribe. So yeah. you should just ease your conscience. Well, it's, it's $2. It's even cheaper for the, for the MVM plus, but, but David does Don't the $5 level and gets every episode a week early, which makes it a little bit more relevant. So he's a, he's a bonus supporter. Yeah. He's the next level up from a base might. So, yeah, I'm not an executive <laughs> producer like Michael Herndon, yeah. but you know, it's <laughs> you're getting there. You're you're almost honorary at this point, I should say. <laughs> Don't I do give have, him bad unless he gives his get ups his giving. <laughs> <laughs> I do have one question to ask about the show before we close out here. Are you guys going to cover the uh, the Ultraman Zero movies when they come out? Because they are technically giant monster movies. We're definitely going to cover Shin Ultraman Um, and to kind of prepare for Shin Ultraman whenever that date comes out. And we go by like American release dates. Um, Mm -hmm. So like we're not covering Singular Point right now. Uh, We're not covering Evangelion right now. Um, So Mm -hmm. we go by American release dates. We will cover Shin Ultraman and we may add in a couple of standalone Ultra movies just to kind of build up to um, Shin Ultraman. Those are not really standalone Ultra movies. We might take a couple of them, uh, like Ultraman the Next, potentially we've talked about. Uh, maybe Ultra Q the movie and just kind of lead up to Shin Ultraman. So maybe Ultraman Zero movies as well. We'll have to see. Yeah, you, you have to do at least uh, the Mega Monster Battle Ultra Galaxy, the first one. Um, it's the introduction of Belial. Like, it's such a good movie and there's right. so many fun callbacks. So, you definitely would be missing out if you don't do that one. Nice. So my half to. Have you fun. ever considered the Empire Strikes Back? It's got a big monster. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely does. That might have to go on our list after. So does Attack of the Clones, but I'm not. <laughs> we shouldn't be encouraging that. Or should we? All right, Chris. I'm what an are we discussing producer now? <laughs> Chris, what are we discussing <laughs> next episode? Uh, we are we're gonna go into Ultraman Ginga S actually. We're going to follow up immediately. And that's the first. It's the first eight episodes. Mm-hmm. What is it total? 16 probably then? Yeah. It will okay. uh, 16 and then we'll have uh, two movies. Two movies. Man, we're going to be like a giant monster movie covering podcast. Monsters versus Ultraman. I call it. <laughs> trademark, trademark, trademark. So uh, what episodes are we covering? Oh, time? yeah. They are episodes one through eight. The power to open the way and the desperate battle in the sunrise, which is what awesome. I call waking up in the morning. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I alluded to, but I actually didn't even mention that. Uh, so we are going to be doing a bonus episode a week after this one comes out uh, where we are going to be chatting with Eric about Monsters vs. Men, his journey with his uh, film taste We're going to discuss fandom obsession and expectations. And we always seem to come back to the MCU, but this time it's because he's been watching the Marvel movies with his wife. So I thought it'd be interesting to hear that journey. (laughs) So uh, thank you again for listening to our podcast. Uh, As we said many times, it's easy to get caught up with reviews, but we really just want to hear from you. So whether that's sharing your thoughts on an episode we covered uh, again, we make so many mistakes, so you can let us know what those are. Or if you just want to chat, feel free to send us an email at atrashespod at protonmail.com or head over to atrashespod.com where you'll find our contact form for listener feedback and even prayer requests. But until next time, Chris, I will let you say it. Oh, the one time I was going to just say, listen. Nope, uh, I'll give it to you. May Kid Tara watch over you. <laughs> I create some voice men to keep you safe.
<laughs> that was so weird. Hmm, I know. I was more trying to remember Kid Taro's name, and I forgot the whole thing. It's Kid Taro. I almost, I prom. actually, am, are we going to get to Kid Taro again soon? Uh, not soon. Damn it. <laughs>